Did you know black women in the U.S. are three times more likely to die from pregnancy and childbirth than any other race? Today, in recognition of Black Maternal Awareness Week, we dive into the facts with Dr. LaShawna McIntosh, OBGYN with Trinity Health Mid-Atlantic. She will shed light on Black maternal health in the greater Philadelphia region. I'm your host, Margie Zimmerman, and this is Beyond the Stethoscope. Hello, Dr. McIntosh. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today to discuss this serious topic on why black women are suffering the most complications from pregnancy and childbirth. Thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to highlighting this really important topic. Every year, Black Maternal Awareness Week is recognized April 11th through the 17th to help shed light on the difficulties that black women and their babies are experiencing, not only in this area, but across the country. Can you shed some light on the common problems that you see among your patients that contribute to the fact that black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy and childbirth in the U.S.? Absolutely. So Black Maternal Awareness Week was started about five years ago by a group of women called the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. And it was officially recognized by the White House in 2021 under the Biden administration. And the goal is to bring awareness to the racial disparities and maternal outcomes, uh, as well as uh, the outcomes of the, the babies born to these black moms. Um, there's not only awareness, there's also now federal funding behind it and also a lot of research that's being put into understanding why this disparity exists. Um, so here are some staggering statistics. One is that out of all of the developing nations in the world, developed nations in the world, the U.S. is the only one that, that has consistently seen a rise in maternal mortality rates as well as infant mortality rates. And that number is driven solely by the increased mortality rates of black women. So understanding that as a, as a t statistic, you have to say, well, what is going on here? We're one of the most developed nations in the world and we can't get this right. You, what's happening here? Exactly. And... So we know that in our country that black women are three times as likely to die as compared to their, to their white counterparts. Again, what's happening here? And if they correct for socioeconomic status, the, the disparity continues. There is no protection because you're educated or because you have access to care. And so when I approach this problem, I think about it in three different ways. I look at it from the patient. Like, what is the patient bringing to the table? And truly, if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, if you're overweight, um, you're going to be in a higher risk category. And so these are some factors that I can talk to my patients about before they get pregnant, um, about how to modify certain things to improve their outcomes. Um, also thinking about the patient, you think about access to care. Are they in a medical desert where there aren't health care clinics? Are we talking about someone who has access to care, but the care they're getting is poor quality care? And so we, we have to look at the person and how they are when they get to you. The second thing I look at is the environment that the woman is, is living in. Because as I mentioned before, when you correct for access to care and quality of care, or even educational level of these patients, it doesn't it doesn't clear up the the picture. It doesn't it doesn't show that someone who graduated from college has better outcomes than someone who didn't. So we have to say, well, what's going on here? And we look at the women in the world that they live in, and what we're finding is that it's racism in America, not race, that is actually driving these numbers upwards. Um, and they, there is a study, and it's, uh, I think the, the term that was coined is weathering. And that's your body's response 
to a constant to, to being under constant pressure, under constant stress. And so black women in this country have they are constantly faced with racism in their workplace, at the hospitals, and just in society in general. And as a result of being under constant stress, they have higher heart rates, leads a higher cortisol level, and these make them more vulnerable to having heart disease and obesity and, and other uh, uh, poor health outcomes. So when we look at black women who have immigrated here, when they come here and they have their babies, their babies are of normal birth weight birth weights. They're more similar to the average white woman in this country. But two, one to two generations in, their baby's birth weights start to go down and they start to look more like the non-immigrant black woman in this country. So there's something that happens once they are part of this culture that adversely affects them. Contrast that to the immigrant white woman she comes here, and when you compare the birth weight of the, the first child that's here, the, the first baby that's born here, that baby's birth weight will, uh, I'm sorry, with subsequent generations, the baby's birth weights will go up, meaning that her health outcomes improve as a, as a consequence of being in this country. So there is definitely something in our culture that we need to address. And, and a lot of the uh, research is looking at the microaggressions in our society um, to, in hopes of helping to mitigate some of those increased risk. The third thing we look at is the medical community. And what can I do as a physician to help to change this course? Um, so the medical community has been inherently dismissive of black women and their concerns. And we can go all the way back 400 years to slavery time, right, when women were treated as property. But even in the 1800s and 1900s, when um, we were really developing the, the field of gynecology and obstetrics, black women were used as subjects. And the medical students were taught that. That, you, that they don't feel pain the same way. I so, can imagine. You cannot even imagine. <laughs> and, and the unfortunate thing is that it persists. These, these fallacies persist throughout medical education now. And they did a study of University of Virginia medical students, and they quizzed them about their perceptions about black patients. And as it turns out, this is in the 2000s, that they still believe that black people have blood that clots more often, that black people do not feel pain in the same way that other races do. So we have a higher pain tolerance and that we are, um, that our skin is thicker. <laughs> Not sure where that comes into play. But even as late as the 2000s, we are still holding on to certain misperceptions. Now, is there any new education that the doctors need to, yes. obviously so. there's, <laughs> they need to be educated on this because because that we all come with inherent biases, right? Mm -hmm. And so most programs are now trying to incorporate some kind of awareness of what biases you're bringing to the table because really there should be standardization of care, meaning everyone should be treated to the same care no matter what their race or socioeconomic background is. So sad. and I hope as things will get better as we move forward. There are questions that new moms-to-be should be asking their provider, you know, when they find out they're pregnant Absolutely. and they come to visit you. So I want to dive in to talk about some of them. What is your approach to prenatal care and your overall goals for your patients? So my approach to prenatal care is understanding what, uh, what my patients' concerns are. Maybe they've had a bad outcome. Maybe they've had a bad experience. Uh, maybe they have been reading a lot on the internet about how they're going to be marginalized. So I need to understand, I need to meet them where they are. I need them to understand that I'm going to be there to advocate for them. I need them to understand that I'm there to listen to them and try to best support them through the pregnancy so that they have a more favorable outcome. Um, 
I also keep up with literature. I keep up with standards of care because I not only want them to want to come to their uh, to their appointments, but I want it to be impactful, and I want them to understand that I'm giving them the highest quality care that that mm-hmm. that I can. Yeah, that's so important. Another question, especially Black mothers may have, is what is your overall awareness in morbidity and mortality among Black moms and in your current population? What were the outcomes? So I'm very aware of what's happening nationally, um, that for every 100,000 women, black women who are pregnant, uh, we have 41 deaths as compared to a white woman where it's 13 per 100,000. Um, I'm also aware that uh, the people that are right behind us would be the Pacific Islanders. Um, so, and they, I believe they have 28 uh, deaths per t- per 100,000. So I'm very aware of the statistics. Um, I have a lot come a lot of information coming out about uh, about programs that are out there to help to improve the our, our statistics. Um, I'm also aware that the babies don't do as well. So I'm staying on top of that uh, with my patients. Uh, but as far as my particular practice, one thing that I, I can offer is that I actually do listen to my patients. And I think that it's so important. It's so important. It, well, it is. And, and doctors are under a lot of stress. Providers are under a lot of stress. They, they, the appointment times are fewer, the amount of documentation is a, a lot, and it's and easy. Time. You yeah. don't have time, right? Um, and, and so it's important for a patient to not feel rushed. It is important for a patient to feel they have access to you when they have concerns. Um, so I, I think that my office does a, a pretty good job of making sure that patients have access to care and questions. And it's 24 hours a day that they have it. Also, That's being wonderful. at St. Francis Hospital, we're a smaller unit. And so there's more communication between the nurses and the doctors. And so the patient's not one out of 30 that were taken care of that day. And there's always a, an OBGYN in-house. Very different. Um, we uh, So I feel that we, I, I would believe that we're probably below the national average, but it's because it's a small practice. There's more access to the providers. And when they get to the hospital, there's more access, again, to your, to your, your medical team when you hear. That's good to know. Are C-sections safer for black mothers and babies to reduce the overall morbidity and mortality rates? So there's no no literature to support that. We still yeah, we mm. still do cesarean sections mostly for concerns around the baby. You know, if the baby's in distress or the baby's not turned the right way, it's not typically done for maternal reasons. There are some exceptions to that. But as far as what we can do to uh, to decrease the morbidity or mortality for black women, it's actually low dose aspirin, and oh, also do that right from the beginning. From the, the beginning. Aspirin? From the beginning. From first trimester. I have not heard of that. So there's okay. literature to show that that helps to decrease the number of hypertensive uh, problems or blood pressure related. Issues that, that we have. even if they do not have any problems with that, that's still like recommended to prevent that. They're interesting. If we look for risk factors and we start them on it immediately. So and studies so have been shown that studies that helps. have been shown. Wow. Absolutely, I did not know that. And also doulas. Doulas. Now, can you tell doula. me about doulas? Sure. So doulas are patient advocates, and they have study after study have shown that when a patient has a an advocate that there's a decrease in C-section rates, there's a, there's a decrease in adverse outcomes, increase in breastfeeding, less postpartum depression. So but what is, sorry to interrupt, what is the difference between a midwife and a doula? So midwives actually do the deliveries, whereas a doula usually is a support person or a patient advocate. Oh, they typically, they are not trained to do the delivery. Okay, so if someone didn't have like a family member 
Correct. for someone to Some, be there with them. Someone to empower the, them. Yes, a doula would help and it reduces someone stress. Their, it, it reduces stress and um, it also, sometimes a patient doesn't know it's an issue. Sometimes mm -hmm. a patient has no idea that what they're feeling is a, is a marker for something that could be going wrong, a headache, right? A, a patient gets a headache and she delivered three days ago, could just be a headache because she's tired. It also could mean that she has preeclampsia. And that she's about to have a stroke or a seizure. Why? And maybe a 16-year-old or even a 26-year-old who doesn't understand medicine, maybe they wouldn't know to call a doctor. But the doula is checking in with her. She says, how are you feeling today? Oh, so now this is after. The doula would still check in with them after they deliver right. the baby. Usually it, it, at so a minimum six weeks. So they stay with them a period, with a period of time. Absolutely. Oh, that's so important. And now, are doulas, um, are they covered by insurance? So this is state by state. I believe right now in Delaware, we are trying to find funding for doulas um, through the Medicaid program. And also in Pennsylvania, they have approved uh, coverage for doulas uh, for patients who have Medicaid. Also, you can pay out of pocket and have a doula. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. And that's, that's something that's really good to know. How would someone go about get, finding a doula? Because I'm sure maybe a lot of people aren't aware of a doula and how helpful it would be to them during their pregnancy. How would they go about finding a doula? So you can definitely check websites. Um, you can talk to your health care provider. I know I have a list of doulas that I you have You talk to your with. patients about doulas? We do. Because a lot of people probably are we unaware of that. We have a policy. It comes in their prenatal packet. That's wonderful. Um, and so that's definitely an option out there for my for my patients. Um, if there is a, if they know a midwife, midwives usually work very closely with doulas. And so you can talk to a, a midwife. But I would start with your healthcare professional or start with the internet, uh, group chats about it. That's wonderful. That's good to know. I did not know that. And my last question. How would you handle concerns that may seem trivial? So I should start with, I don't ever think about a question as being trivial. I believe... Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> the patients can be very subtle about what they are concerned about. And so it's my job to take that clue and try to figure out what's really at the root of this question. Patients come to your office, they're anxious. You know, they're nervous or they're in the hospital. And they might be shy about their complaints or, or maybe the words aren't coming out right. So it's up to me to, to be a detective and try to understand. Put it all together. Put it all together so that when she leaves, mm -hmm. she's, she's felt heard mm -hmm. and not marginalized. Because we do know yes. that being dismissive is the number and then they one. they feel funny to call you and reach out to you if there's anything else going wrong because, you know, they think that you're not going to hear them or pay attention to them. Correct. And, and this is what happened with Serena Williams. Um, oh, can you tell us what happened to sure. Serena Williams? Sure. Um, she had a, uh, an article in the New York Times Magazine. This was a few years back. And this is the first time that I really thought about um, the disparity in health care between black women and everyone else. And so what happened to Serena is that when she wasn't pregnant, I believe it was in 2010, she actually had a blood clot that went to her lungs. So time passes, she makes it through that, and she gets pregnant, has a baby. And a few days after her delivery, she feels short of breath again. And she's trying to get the attention of the medical staff, her nurse, and she's trying to get attention. She said, I know what's happening. I need to be started on heparin now. She was dismissed. Serena Williams, wow. one of the most famous people in the world, extremely wealthy. They just ignored access. her concerns. They when ignored her concern. She kept her history. Like she's this had trouble history. with this. Absolutely. Kept coughing. The incision breaks open from her coughing. She's coughing because she's throwing blood clots to her lung. And they take her to surgery, and they stitch that back up, and she's out, and she's like, there's something really wrong with me. She could have me. died. She could have died. She could have died. And her nurse at the time said, I think you're just exhausted. You're just relax. 
Um, and then her provider comes in, orders a necessary test, and sure enough, she's had another blood clot to her lung or an embolism. And if Serena Williams, who is, if you've ever seen her play, yes. she ain't shy. Mm -hmm. If she had a hard time advocating for herself, imagine, imagine. what the experience is mm -hmm. for everyone else. Yeah, and then they that they didn't listen to her. That they when didn't she listen. Knew that she had this before, and they still wouldn't listen to her. They still wouldn't listen, and it's very it underscores the importance of making sure that if you have a healthcare professional who's not listening, or he's in he or she's in a group where they don't listen, or you get there and and you you have no connection with your treatment team, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. The, the that the relationship between the patient and their and her doctor is so important and we as medical professionals for professionals have to start to strengthen that trust again that we had with our patients but now it's it, it's it's going away or it's gone and it's because we have on some level let them down and it's time to get it back and the fact that, you know, you just have a baby, so you don't know, you know, some people don't know how you may be feeling. So, I mean, she was lucky that she knew that she had this before. So I guess it's good if you do have a doula, someone that could still advocate you advocate for you during, you know, when you're in the hospital and you deliver a baby and there's complications. And these complications can last up to a year. So right now, some of the funding um, that's going through Congress or that's being proposed is to cover uh uh, patients for a year following the birth of their child. Right now, it's just, I think it's up to 12 weeks after the delivery. But yeah, women I can die fine. up to one year after and have it be related to the, to I the pregnancy. I was unaware of that. I did mm -hmm. not realize that. So, and is that because, you know, they... The changes in the heart, the changes the in the, um, in your, how your blood clots... So a lot of the changes that happen during pregnancy, but most of them are related to cardiac issues. Wow. Well, thank you so much. You're Dr. welcome. McIntosh, thank you <laughs> for being here today to share your insights and your compassion on the serious topic that is affecting black women and their babies again across the country. And we appreciate you being here during Black Maternal Awareness Week. And we hope that in time, this is not going to happen anymore. And that black women and their babies are gonna get the care that they need and that they deserve. Agreed, agreed, thank you. If you would like to learn more about maternity at Trinity Health Mid-Atlantic, please visit us online at trinityhealthma.org forward slash maternity. Thank you all for joining us today. Please stay tuned for future episodes of Beyond the Stethoscope.